Hello and welcome to Singapore Fintech Festival brought to you by the DIT in partnership with 11FS, Innovate Finance and the City of London Corporation. I'm Gemma Godfrey, non-executive director at IWP and a serial fintech entrepreneur and I'm joined by group CEO of 11FS, David Breer. So how are you doing, David? Pretty good, pretty good. I'm super impressed with everything that I've seen so far as well. Great. Well, it's been a great day of content so far, and I just want to dig into some of the sessions um, with you and kind of get your thoughts on them as well, because obviously they've been a lot of hot topics. And we'll also go through some of your questions at the end for everyone that's watching. So please do keep sending them through the live chat and we'll cover them in the se second half of this session as well. So to start off with, the first one we're going to look at is a one that I moderated between Piyush Gupta, the Chief Executive Officer um, at DBS Group, and Rishi Kozla, the CEO and co-founder of Oak North. And it's called Innovating in Financial Services. This is a CEO masterclass and it you know started off at very punchy, which is fantastic. Um, so it would be good to kind of get your own thoughts, David, as a CEO yourself, as well as your your views on the points that were raised. I mean, there was quite a lot of um, debate going on, but also it was great to see where they could collaborate as well. Definitely. I mean, it's uh, it's always good to see some competition between uh, the the sort of different sides of this equation, isn't it, in terms of the, the fintech side and the banking side. But um, I thought it was a great debate. I mean, I, I should say, Gemma, I don't want to uh, make you blush, but um, I think it's great to see great people running these sessions as well, because I think the quality of the conversation just changes the dynamic of it as well. So um, but I thought it was really good. There were some great points made on both sides. But uh, uh, I think the, uh, the great thing is that we've seen an organization like DBS who really understands the changes that they've needed to make in order to be able to be competitive in this market. And we've seen an organization like Oak North, who really are one of the, the poster childs for really you know, great returns in terms of the level of revenue and the level of impact that they're actually having in the UK market. So it um, was really, really good to see. Yeah, and don't worry about it. You're not flattering me at all because I remember the beginning of it. Um, I made a statement about the difference between fintechs and financial incumbents, and I was told that you know they categorically disagreed with my definition. So it's, <laughs> it's great to have a good debate, and I think it's good to always have different views as well. So um, I mean, in terms of Richie's opening statement as well, and he was talking about the importance of nailing down early doors who your customer is, and obviously I personally am a massive uh, proponent of com uh, proponent of that as well. Which is there's no point building something unless you know who you're building it for, and um, and it's all about how working out how you can best serve the customer and making that kind of a rallying cry for your business you know what do you think of that as something that you know really is the focus of, of what you build as a fintech or financial incumbent either yeah I'd, I'd say i mean all startups start in that place don't they 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 sort of see a problem they see a, a gap in the market is you know overcharged or underserved in that space um really i'd say the the banks have very much started in this place as well but just maybe 200 300 years ago in terms of what they were doing so and and many of those organizations i guess it's it's sort of rekindling that fire in a big incumbent for solving real customer problems rather than just solving the business's problems uh, and i think organizations like dbs you know we've seen it in other organizations like natwest as well you know rekindling that fire for solving real customer problems and really sort of getting to grips with the the sort of brutal realities of the day-to-day -day lives that those organizations, uh, those individuals really face, um, I think starts to sort of move them in a very different direction, uh, which is a great thing to see. I agree. I mean, I think there was a massive shift probably around the time of the financial crisis, away from the traditional model of let's let's create products to sell to people. And then actually it's focusing on what, prod what problems do people actually have that we can then help solve. And I think that was a pivotal moment. Um, so let's get to the contentious point then. Do you agree with Piyush's point that if a business is customer centric, then there should be no distinction between FinTech and a larger financial institution? And just to explain for anybody that missed any of it, because it was right at the beginning, what I, what I was saying was that traditionally what we tend to think of is a financial incumbent has the benefit of scale uh, and purchasing power and, and re resources behind them. And a fintech, the benefit there usually is about being nimble. You know, they're usually uh, nimble startups and they can do things quicker and faster and really focus on solving that need. And obviously then coming together is, is a fantastic collaboration. But actually, is that potentially, is that old school? Are we now in an era where there shouldn't be that distinction and you should be able to be that customer centric, whether you are, you know, whether you're, whether, whether if you're in finance anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, personally, I, I think it's, uh, I think DBS are, are quite a unique organization in terms of the way in which they go about that. I think the the, the most sustainable advantage that startups have over incumbents is, is speed uh, in terms of their abilities to actually do things. Um, I actually don't think any incumbent 
you know, I've definitely that I've come across and that I've talked to and I've talked to quite a few. I don't think any of them really don't know what to do. The problem is about execution at speed uh, and actually not just speed through to a customer of ideas, but fundamentally not losing the quality of those ideas as you go through. Um, so, I mean, I, I think where organizations have made changes to allow much more uh, multidisciplinary teams, you know, collaborative working processes. We've seen this in places like, you know, Standard Chartered with what they've done with things like mocks you know it's not just about changing the customer proposition that you're delivering it's a fundamental rethink of actually the operating model the operating rhythm to get there um so while i i i, uh, I think dbs are probably a slightly different beast than, than a lot out there um i'm not sure i, I agree with his view that uh, there isn't that great difference because i think even if you understand the customer even if you really understand the problem execution is is really the key thing so if we move then on to innovation then as a point, should innovation be leading the way? Because obviously there, DBS are redefining what innovation means uh, to try and stay focused on the customer. And it seems like mindsets are changing around innovation. So should we let innovation lead and are mindsets changing fast enough? Um, I think innovation sort of got a bit of a bad name in financial services over the last sort of maybe five to 10 years, if I'm honest with you. I think they were the, they were the cool kids in the corner sort of playing with all the, the toys, weren't they? And, and really, I think what we've sort of learned, I mean, particularly in this pandemic period, it's like POCs and, and you know, nice prototypes aren't the answer. I mean, there was no prototype for remote working for your entirety of your organization. It was like it was a execution game. So, you know, PowerPoint and nice ideas are great, but fundamentally, unless it's impacting your customers, then it doesn't really matter. And I think this is still the distinction between startups and big incumbents. I think the big incumbents have the almost the luxury of of time, the luxury of spending money where it might be a dead end. Um, whereas actually from a startup perspective, it's that brutal focus on ensuring that actually the things that you're doing are materially changing the the service, the offering, the the opinion of the, the people who are using your product. So um so I think, you know, I think maybe rightly so innovation got a bit of a dirty word, but but I think if it's innovation that really impacts the customer, then I'm all for that. Um, I think the, the the difference that we're sort of seeing potentially on the innovation side as well, and you know, Gemma, I know you know as much about this as I do, is like it's actually moving just not just from that sort of customer experience side of things, but to back office. You know, much more big. Uh, problems there for the incumbents, the core banking systems, the payment rails, the you know the the things that are materially driving such ridiculous operating costs uh, across those organisations. So, and that's exciting because it feels like it's not just shiny things for shiny sake. It's actually solving really sizable business problems. It's really interesting that because what you're, you're drawing an analogy then between financial incumbents of the of old school, which was all about let's think of a product and let's sell it. And now you're saying that actually innovation is getting a dirty word because it's, again, innovation for innovation's sake. Again, you're in an ivory tower thinking of what cool things can we do and call it innovation rather than, again, focusing on, well, we've got a back office system that really needs upgrading. And in order to deliver that, you know, we need we need this type of technology. So actually, that, that, I think that was a fantastic analogy. And then just before we move, because I know there's so much to talk about, I'm running out of time, but um, <laughs> Before we move on to the second session, can we just talk a little bit about the UK? Because obviously, you know, uh, in terms of where we are, you know, Rishi was passionate about the UK being um, kind of a, like a showcase of, of banking excellence for, the, ex excellence for the rest of the world. So do you agree? And also, and it's a bit of a big question here, but how can the UK better lead and collaborate with the, the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we definitely are at the moment. Uh, I think the... I mean, you touched on this a little bit earlier on in terms of the changes that came about as part of the the crash. You know, 2008, the changes that we saw, the you know government-led uh, push to change the the dynamic in the market from being just the big incumbents to really fostering competition. You know, the changes that we saw with the FCA, the PRA, the Bank of England, all of them has really got us to the point now where we have you know organisations who can get to market and serve customers in really unique ways, and that that dynamic is creating you know, great tension with the incumbents to actually have to, you know, step their game up, quite frankly. So and, and we've seen that ripple out into obviously, you know, we've seen uh, Maz and HKMA and Australia and the US as well. Um, so I think the the challenge really is for the for the UK is, um, you know, we're on that difficult sort of second album. You know, we've got that. Uh, we did a, a great job in the first one and everybody's <laughs> like rallying behind it. But actually to kind of keep that 
sort of level of quality up and continue to lead in that space. I mean, there's great things happening in open banking in the UK. We're really sort of setting the agenda and pushing further and further forward with those things. Um, but I think there's so much more that we really can do. I think it's going to take some pretty interesting partnerships, I think. And, mm -hmm. and the, I, I know with everything that we've done with Sandboxes and everything with the FCA, they're always talking to people, always listening to people in terms of the opportunities to uh, better regulate, better serve, and and really better enable the organisations within the UK to to really lead from the front when it comes to em embracing new technology. So, uh, if I'm honest with you, I think the the best thing that we can really do is is not see this as a uh, a, a race where we win or lose, but just a continuous process where we can, you know, we continually need to keep evolving. Uh, and everything that I'm seeing from the Bank of England, the FCA, definitely sort of gives me uh, a view that that uh, that will continue to be the case. And I think that's one of the key issues when we're talking about fintech. You know, it's not just about creating technology for technology's sake. You have to work with the regulator. I think that's key. Um, I won't ask you what boy band or pop group you think we are. <laughs> but, uh, let's just move on. So uh, moving on to the second session, which was, um, um, you know, we're going to turn to the session se second session, which is about the future of finance, about the future of finance being green. And obviously it's very exciting. That was with Mark Carney, uh, the financial advisor to the Prime Minister uh, for COP26 and the UN Special um, Envoy for Climate Action and Finance. And obviously Ravi Menon as well, the Managing Director for the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So obviously a hotly anticipated and a fantastic session there. So, so Mark Carney outlined his plans to try and grow a mainstream sustainable form of finance and to ensure that all private financial decisions take climate change into account in the same way you would do credit worthiness, interest rate risk, or anything about you know future technologies. Is that actually a credible objective? I mean, I, I think in this climate, I think it's quite a tough sell. Uh, I'd say for uh, for a lot of uh, organisations who have some you know pretty significant problems to be sort of dealing with. I mean, I should say, I mean, I thought James did a fantastic job on on that session. I actually didn't think he was going to get a, a word in edgeways a, a few times there, just because you've got two people who are, are just yeah. so passionate about the subject matter, haven't you? That uh, that they, I think they could have gone for hours and hours and hours on that one. Uh, I said to you earlier on, do you know what? I was just quite excited to see inside Mark Carney's house as well. Like, I figured, <laughs> I, I felt like that was quite an interesting uh, sort of through the keyhole moment, but. Uh, yeah. But I, I'd say on the, I mean, on the the green agenda and everything that's happening from an, an ESG perspective, I think it's been it's been quite a difficult thing to have um, set up for quite a while because I, I actually think it was um, quite a tough decision for individuals to be making. I think from an organisational perspective, you will always do what your customers will buy or engage with or, or demand, essentially. Um, but while funds were not really performing particularly well, then it was sort of like the uh, doing good tax for people. You know, it's like uh, if you want to eat healthy, yeah. it costs you a lot more money. Um, yeah. So actually being in a situation where they weren't quite performing as, as they need to be. But actually now we're in a situation where the you know ESG funds are outperforming normal funds uh, in many instances and there are so many great initiatives that actually uh, require investment at this stage so you know we've seen organizations like Goldman Sachs really sort of lead the way to make these things happen BlackRock as well in terms of changes that we're, we've sort of seen there um, I think it really sort of goes not just from an organizational perspective but I think it will be customer demand led as well because increasingly people are wanting to be doing the right thing uh, and now that they can do the right thing and not be punished for doing the right thing, then uh, it, from a financial perspective, then uh, then I think it will um, it will definitely tick up and tick up. I mean, it's interesting. It sounds also like you know, it's always painful to be the first mover. You know, it's where you want to be. Um, it's where, but but as you said, you know, it, it's taken a bit of time for certain trends to catch up. And especially, I mean, if we, if we talk about the pandemic, you know, people are realizing their health is more important. You've seen, way, you know, obviously acceleration of, of global warming. So or you've, you've now got those trends where people are, you know, the rise of veganism, you know, people are really caring much more about their planet themselves, which is obviously then feeding back into the companies that they want to work with or give their money to, which then obviously, you know, you, you kind of want, I guess, that push and pull, which is you, you want as a corporate, it's not just about it coming from the top, you also want customers to be demanding it as well. And then, as mm. you said, it hits the bottom line, they're saving on energy costs, their carbon offsetting. And I think, I think um, it, you know, maybe it's taken a bit of time for the corporate world to kind of catch up, but hopefully that's going to be a growing trend. So how much, how much I mean, do you think? Oh, go on, I was going to say, I think, I think on that one, I think it's it's hard mm. because the the sort of third dynamic in that is not just the organisations and the customers, but shareholders as well. And I think yeah. while uh, while organisations were under pressure for shareholders to, in many instances, make you know reasonably unrealistic kind of returns around the things that we're doing, I think there's much more of a sort of an equitable 
share now of where those things are and given the like say the rise of all of these different organizations and different options from an investment perspective then it feels like all of the different demands of those different parties can can properly be met now absolutely and and, and that's kind of the best place that you want to be and definitely investors are, are feeling that as well i mean i remember you know years and years ago people were talking about all oh, ethical and it was like a niche as you said like a niche a niche project a uh, product like you know investment that people would make mm. and now it's far more mainstream and that's as you say like essential as well so we've actually had a question in which is talking about the pandemic and the consequences and just saying you know if we look at the consequences and you know companies are rethinking their strategies which is helping drive sustainable strategies forward you know do you think that, pe that companies are rethinking their strategies and really can finance makes enough of a difference to climate change as well what do you think <laughs> Um, I, I think um, I think everybody's rethinking their strategies in this period. I think the uh, you know all bets are off for what the uh, the sort of next couple of years look like. But I'd say uh, if anything, you know, we're look we're we're talking at a before Gemma. Me and you would have had to have fl flown out to Singapore to do this, you know. So yeah. actually, in, we're we're living in a more connected, more digital world than ever before. And I think the 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 plans that everybody had for the next five years, they probably have to get through over the next eighteen months now to really stay relevant in the market in terms of what they're doing. So, so I think the the dynamic has changed, and the uh, acceleration that we'll see to a really truly digital world, I think, is uh, is moving forwards. I mean, can can financial services make such a dramatic difference in the the um, the environmental agenda? I mean, I think as as customers become more aware of the ramifications of the 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 purchasing decisions that they do, so I think actually as this moves more and more to a uh, less and less about purely long tail of investments and what investments are being made in but actually it's the micro investments it's me buying more ethically my coffee on a on a on monday morning when it's cold and i need some warmth you know it's like these decisions and actually i mean a lot of organizations i think again uh, natwest and a few others have started to do this in the uk surfacing actually the the rating really against your buying behavior uh, and i think when buying behavior starts to shift then you'll find mm -hmm. more retail organizations start taking it really seriously and more retail organizations taking it really seriously will have that ripple effect of of really the whole world kind of becoming in a better place i mean in this period everybody not traveling for a little bit is probably a good thing as well isn't it for the for the world to sort of heal a little bit and hopefully you know there'll be a lot less trips to uh, to far fun places just to uh, to do speaking engagements and that types of things and that'll do a little bit for a lot of people as well I, I agree but it's interesting because I think I think everything you said is also kind of linked together because if you have reg regular consumers making on a day-to-day -day basis more ethical decisions that mm. impacts companies people are buying more ethical companies then have to and then the share price of companies that are more ethical will do better so investors will naturally want to be backing them so I think that's that's a great point we actually had a question in which says should we rethink the tax system and apply scoring models that give incentives to companies that apply the ESG mindset which is interesting because that links back to what you were saying in the beginning around um, there, there, there used to be a tax on being ethical should actually there be a tax benefit I mean I think I think, personally, so. I think that's I think that's I think that's a great idea yeah, I, I agree with you. I think I could see that working really effectively. I mean, we had that in sort of early days, didn't we, with solar panels and all different types of things. And, you know, we we obviously uh, uh, see a, a benefit from a, you know, car tax perspective for electric cars. So, you know, I think the government have got a pretty decent track record of incentivizing the right behavior until it becomes mainstream. So um, I, I think I'd be um, pretty pro on that one. It's uh, it's going to be interesting to see quite how that would be implemented, though, I guess. Yeah, I think, I think the practicality is going to be different, dif difficult. But I do want to say one thing, and that is they were talking about green infrastructure, you know, the green economy and, sh and comparing it to the shift towards digitization. And obviously 11FS's mantra is that digital finance is only 1% done. Do you think that's the same <laughs> of the green economy? Try and keep it short. <laughs> uh, I, I'd say probably even less than 1% on that side of things. I, th I think we're, we're very much getting there. And, and as you say, all of the different parts of that equation, you know, the the sort of uh, demand and, uh, you know, manufacturing side of that in terms of what, where the green agenda is going. But I think, as you said, look, people are increasingly trying to be better and do more and take a long term view, not just a selfish view of, of what benefits them. So I think this will be a, a major trend over the next couple of years. Fantastic. Well, that's all we have time for. Bang, like one minute left. Um, so thank you so much to all of you for your questions and for joining us today. And thank you so much to David for joining me here live from Singapore FinTech Festival 2020. I hope that you enjoy the rest of the day's content and see you back here for the second live Q&A where I'll be picking David's brain again on another couple of sessions from today's agenda. So hope to see you soon. Bye for now.